On Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guest for the hour is ta Coates, the national correspondent at The Atlantic. His new book is called Between the World and Me. Juan? I want to ask you, in the book, you talk about the influences on your life, specifically when you first began uh, reading Malcolm X uh, and the enormous influence he had on your life, and also the fact that your father was a member and a leader of the Black Panther Party, uh, and the influence that those uh, uh, movements of, the, of Malcolm and the Panthers had on your consciousness and your uh, and your upbringing. Well, they had a tremendous uh, influence. These are, these are my first uh, sources, you know, of, of skepticism. The notion that one should be skeptical, you know, of the narratives that that, that one is presented with. The, that that's the first place I learned. It. <clears throat> one of the, 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 the things that's really really present in between the world and me is I am in in some ways outside of the African American tradition. The African American tradition, in, in the main, is very very uh, church based, very very Christian. Has, you know, accepts you know certain narratives about the world. I, I didn't really have that present in my house. As you said, my dad was was in the Black Panther Party. Uh, the, the mainstream sort of presentation of the civil rights movement was not something that I directly inherited. And, and, and beyond that, you know, I, I have to say that, you know, just as a young man, you know, and as a boy going out and, and, and navigating the world, the, the ways in which the previous generation struggle presented was presented to me did not particularly make sense. And so, um, Notions of nonviolence, for instance, uh, when I walked out into the streets of West Baltimore, seemed to have very, very little applicability. Uh, violence was essential to one's life there. It was everywhere. It was, it was all around us. And then when one looked out to the broader country, as I became, you know, more politically conscious, it was quite, you know, uh, obvious that violence was essential to, to America, uh, to its past, to its present, and, and to its future. And so there was some degree of distance for me. Uh, between, you know, how, how my politics and how I viewed the world at that time and what was, you know, presented as, as, as my political heritage. And instead, I, I very much, you know, gravitated, you know, to, to, to my dad's, you know, sort of political activism with the Black Panther Party and really to Malcolm X, who, I, you know, I would argue influences this book, who had a very, very pragmatic, tactile view of, of, of America and of history. I, you know, I can remember in message to the grassroots him saying, you know, uh, uh, don't he's you know he's critiquing nonviolence and so he says, don't give up your life, preserve your life. It's the best thing you have going. And if you got to give it up, you know, make sure it's even Stephen. And some hear that as braggadocio, but for me it was a profound claim about the value of your body. That your body is the most essential thing you have, and it should not be sacrificed because these folks down in Mississippi or Alabama are out of their mind. Preserve your body, and that to me was just so beautiful and so real. It was not esoteric. It made perfect sense. To and me. you say he was the most honest leader. <laughs> he was the most honest. But he's the first honest man I knew. Somewhat, yes. you know, I knew other honest men, but you know, in, in a bit of uh, hyperbole, he was the first honest man. He was the first person I heard, and it, 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 it matched what I saw when I walked outside. It matched what I saw when I opened up, you know, my history books about the country. Uh, it, it, it just seemed, you know, when, when he says, you know, when Malcolm says, you know, uh, e violence is wrong in America and violence is wrong. But that is such a, you know, essential critique that should be leveled, levied, you know, as far as I'm concerned, before any president that stands up on Martin Luther King Day. Either violence is wrong or it's not. You know, one has to, you know, justify it. And so that, that you know, was just profound to me. You talk about the fear, mm -hmm. living in fear. Yeah, I mean, and, and this, uh, you know, to, to tie this into the previous question, um, life in Baltimore was, is, you know, and will be for some time, uh, you know, quite violent. Um, I can remember, as I, you know, to talk about in the book, you know, being a young man coming out of my elementary school, uh, seeing, a, you know, what should have been just an after-school you know, fight and seeing one of these boys pull out a gun. And being very, very present at the age of, say, 11 years old, that children were walking around with the ability to end the lives of other children. Uh, going into middle school and having an entire ritual uh, totally devoted to making sure I was safe, you know, concerns about what I was wearing, uh, concerns about who I was walking to school with, concerns about how many people I was walking to school with, concerns, you know, uh, 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 during, you know, lunchtime about where I was sitting, where I was spending my time. And at the same time, being aware, dimly aware that somewhere out in the world, uh, the majority of Americans did not have to carry that fear with them. 
you know, and then eventually understanding how that was connected to our politics. Speaking of your childhood, I wanted to go to Marshal Eddie Conway, the former Black Panther leader in Baltimore, Maryland, who was released from prison last year after serving 44 years for a murder he denies committing. For years, Eddie Conway's supporters campaigned for him to be pardoned. Democracy Now! interviewed Eddie Conway less than 24 hours after his release. I asked him about his experience writing a memoir in prison called Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther. I think uh, at some point I realized I was getting older, and I realized that I had uh, a lot of experiences and a lot of history of things that had happened, and they hadn't been recorded, and I think they would have been lost. Uh, to uh, history, and they would have been lessons that had been learned through organizing in prisons that uh, other people could have used. So I think at some point I sat down and I started writing, and I tried to capture what it was that we had tried to do during those turbulent years that George Jackson uh, was organizing in California and uh, Attica occurred uh, in New York. That was Eddie Conway, again, less than 24 hours after his release from prison, where he served 44 years. Can you, ta Coates, talk about Eddie Conway's presence in your life, even behind bars? Well, I—it's I, a little emotional for me, um, and I'll explain why. When people hear the term uh, political prisoner, especially on the left, it, it becomes a kind of um, abstraction. Uh, folks are uh, aware of, you know, injustice, and they're aware that they, you know, there are folks in prison who are in prison, you know, largely because of their activism. Um, Eddie Conway is central to my first memories. Um, my parents used to take me to, uh, when it was open, the, the Baltimore City Penitentiary to see Eddie Conway. Uh, I was talking to my dad about this recently, from the time I'm, I might have been one or two years old. I mean, literally, my first memories are of black men in jail, specifically of Eddie Conway. Um, that was a huge, huge, huge influence on me. I mean, you talk about, like, like this notion of, just going back to your question, one, of, of violence, knowing that, that that was present. And, I, you know, I had this conversation with my dad recently. I asked him, I said, well, why, why did you, you know, take me <laughs> into a prison? Why would you take a three- or four-year-old child? into a prison. And my memories of this are mostly, you know, of being bored and, you know, seeing the gates and, you know, the kind of things that children will remember. And he said, you know, I wanted you to see the face of the enemy. You know, I wanted to see what, what you, you were up against, you know. And so, um, in, in many ways, you know, everything, you know, I've done as a journalist, you know, up into and including this book, you know, really um, begins, like, like, right back there. You know, it's very difficult for me to imagine myself here right now. Uh, without uh, those those uh, experiences, let me just say how happy I am that he he got out. You know, at some point, you know, in my mind, I probably began to conceive a world in which he he, he would die in prison, and I'm happy he did. I want to ask you about uh, another part of the book. It's, uh, I mean, the whole book is impressive, but I, to me, one of the most impressive aspects of it was your description of life. At Howard University, right, and your description right. of the importance of Howard University in the intellectual life of the African American people in the United States, uh, could, could you elaborate on that? Uh, what Howard meant to you? And uh, obviously, you say you didn't spend much time in class; you spent it all in the library, uh, devouring <laughs> all kinds of, 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 of works. But uh, if you could sort of give us a sense of that for for those who are listening and, and watching of, of what the Howard experience meant to you. Well, one of the things that that you know, this theme of the book of, of living under a system of plunder um, and about surviving and, and how you deal with that and how you struggle against it. Um, within that are, are the beautiful things, you know, that, that, that black people have forged, you know, even, you know, in, 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 you know, under, you know, really, really perilous conditions. For me, Howard University is, is one of the most, you know, loveliest, you know, for me personally. Um, to try to explain this, Howard is, you know, one of uh, uh, several historically black colleges and universities is, 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 I think, rather unique in terms of its size and in terms of its scope. Um, it is a, a beacon point, the Mecca, as I call it, as, as it calls itself, you know, uh, in the book for the entire, you know, black diaspora around the world. And so, you know, to come to Howard University at the age of 17, as I did, um, and to see, you know, black people from Montreal, 
uh, to see black people from Paris, to see black people from Ghana, to see black people from South Africa, to see black people from Mississippi, to see black people from Oakland, to see biracial black people, to see black people with, you know, parents, you know, from, from uh, India, to see black people, you know, with, with Jewish parents, you know, things that I had not encountered uh, in, in, in West Baltimore, to see black people who took semesters off, you know, to go to other countries and live, uh, to see black people with deep interests in, in other languages. It, it was um, tremendous. And really what, what it showed me is even within, you know, what seems like a narrow band, which is to say, you know, black life, is in fact quite cosmopolitan. It's, in fact, you know, a, a beautiful, beautiful rainbow. And to see all of these people, you know, in, of all of these different persuasions, um, and to have that heritage, you know, Toni Morrison went to Howard. Mary Baraka went to Howard. Uh, Lucille Clifton went to Howard. I.C. Davis went to Howard. And I was aware of that when I was there. Charles Drew went to Howard. Thurgood Marshall went to the law school. Being aware of that and he, having all of that brought to bear, again, it's one of those things that I, I can't really separate, you know, from, from my career as a writer. So talk, ta Coates, about a friend you made there, about Prince Jones. Um, so um, one, one of the people I met, you know, whose life was very, very different from mine, whose background was very, very different from mine, was, was my friend uh, Prince Jones. Uh, he uh, was the child of, of Mabel Jones. Mabel Jones was born uh, the child of sharecroppers in, in, in you know, just uh, deep, deep poverty in, in rural uh, Louisiana. Uh, through dent of her own intelligence, through dent of her own work, through dent of her own efforts, she raised herself up, uh, became a doctor, uh, went to LSU, served in the Navy, became a, a radiologist, you know, uh, accumulated, you know, some amount of wealth, uh, raised two, you know, beautiful children. You know, one daughter went to UPenn. Her son, Prince, had the ability, really, to go to any Ivy League school, was tremendously, tremendously intelligent, chose Howard University, was attracted to, you know, this, this heritage, this legacy. Uh, went there, um, and one evening, uh, at this point, Prince was engaged to be married, had, had a young uh, daughter. Uh, one evening, a police officer who was dressed as, a, as an undercover officer, dressed as a—who was an undercover officer, dressed as, as a criminal, uh, was in pursuit of some other suspected criminal, somehow confused the two, uh, followed my friend uh, Prince Jones's uh, Jeep from Prince George's County, Maryland, the suburbs of Maryland, through Washington, D.C., out into the suburbs again, into Virginia, where he shot him. Um, and his explanation for this was that Prince tried to, you know, ram his Jeep. But see, again, you know, it's the people who are uh, empowered by the state to kill who bear the responsibility, ultimately. Um, and I have oftentimes tried to imagine myself in Prince's shoes, finding out that somebody is following me, who's literally dressed to be a criminal, you know, uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, across three different jurisdictions. How would I respond? Prince was shot, you know, mere yards from his fiancée's home. Nothing was done about this. The officer was never prosecuted. The officer was, in fact, put back out on the streets to, you know, continue, you know, applying his trade. I had to sit with that for 15 years. And again, that, that was one of the events, not to, you know, to say nothing of what his mother's sitting with it. But that was, you know, another big, big element in wanting to write this book. We're going to break again, but then I'd like to ask you to read from your book. Sure. Um, you have uh, a very powerful section on Prince and his mom, Mabel. Um, we're spending the hour with ta Coates. Uh, he's a national correspondent at The Atlantic. His book is called Between the World and Me. Stay with us.